Let's pray, shall we, as we get into God's Word this morning. Father, we just thank you so much for your Word. It is powerful. It is life-changing. And I pray that as, as it was read this morning, Lord, I, we know that it is powerful and it has an inherent authority. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work during our teaching time and bring this truth to bear in our minds and in our hearts so that we're gripped by it, Father, and we're gripped by the greatness of Jesus. I pray this in his name. Amen. You know, facing reality can be difficult. Can you think back to a time in your life when it was difficult to face reality? Can you think back to a time when you were putting off facing the reality of a particular situation? You may know that when Tegan and I, when we first came here to Adelaide, we had a blue Kia Carnival, a people mover. This is because our family is quite large. We have five children, and then there's Tegan and I. And so we have to have a, a Kia Carnival in order to transport our family around. Well, one of the things that I'm not so good at doing is I'm not so good at keeping up the maintenance on our car. When you go to the mechanic, they'll put this little sticker in the top corner of your windshield, and it tells the mileage so that you can bring your car in for a service. Well, this one time, our car had run over the recommended mileage, and I was living on borrowed time. Every time I got into my car, the little sticker, which is only a few centimetres in length, seemed to be a mile wide, and it seemed to be screaming out at me, do something, you fool. But I refused to face reality, and I just kept on driving. Now, at first, it was not such a big deal, but soon I went 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 kilometers over the recommended limit. And then I heard, well, actually, it was Tegan who heard a noise coming from the engine. And every time we would get into the car, she would ask me whether I heard that sound and whether I thought it was a big problem. But I was refusing to face reality. And so I just said to her, I played dumb, I just said, I can't hear anything. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, have you ever faced a situation like that? Have you ever faced a situation where you refuse to pay attention to the warning signs? A situation where you refuse to face reality? Well, this morning we come back into our study of Revelation and we're looking at living with the end in mind. And as we come to chapters 15 and 16 in the book of Revelation, we see a terrible reality that many people refuse to face. Chapters 15 and 16 of the book of Revelation record for us the events that happen right at the end of the tribulation. The tribulation, you remember, is that seven-year period described in the book of Revelation, a period of great upheaval as God pours out his wrath upon the world. And we saw a few weeks ago that at the midpoint of the tribulation, that seven years, there will be a world leader who will arise, who will be empowered by the enemy, and who will deceive the whole world into worshipping him. But now we come into Genesis, I mean Genesis, Revelation 15 and 16, and we see in verse 1 of chapter 15 that John saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So John is recording in this passage the final outpouring of God's anger against sin in the tribulation. And it is this terrible reality that many people refuse to face. The terrible reality that God will judge. The terrible reality that the God of the Bible is a God who is angry with sin and will pour out judgment upon it. Now, I can understand why many people actually refuse to face this terrible reality. Because facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult. I mean, it is difficult to understand how a loving God could pour out judgment on people. I mean, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament quite clearly portray God's character as that God is a God of love. In fact, it says, God is love. And so it's quite shocking to our ears when we read passages like the one that was read today that talk about God sending seven angels with seven bowls of his wrath and pouring them out on mankind. And these are not just mild judgments, but they are described as having cataclysmic effects. 
Uh, the first judgment brings painful sores on the people who worship the Antichrist. The second judgment then kills everything in the sea. The third judgment then makes all the rivers and springs of the earth turn into blood. With the fourth judgment, the sun scorches the people with fire, with severe heat. And the fifth judgment then plunges the kingdom of the Antichrist into darkness. The sixth judgment causes the great river Euphrates to dry up and demonic powers to be unleashed on the earth. And finally, the seventh causes a great earthquake. It says, such that has never been. And in verse 19 of chapter 16, it says, the great city. Now we saw over in chapter 11 that the great city is a reference to Jerusalem that the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon. Now we're going to look more at Babylon next week as we get into chapters 17 and 18. But God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So God remembered Babylon, but it wasn't like how he remembered we speak of, we see in the Old Testament God remembering people, but it's typically to remember and be gracious to them. But here, he remembers Babylon. He remembers what they've done. And he pours out his wrath, as it says, he drained the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. What an image. That just as you could pour out a cup on the water, here God is going to pour out the cup of his fury and every last drop is going to be drained. As I said, this is quite difficult to read. I find this difficult to read. It's quite shocking to our ears. Even if you take a different perspective on the reading of Revelation, even if you don't take it literally like we do, but, but see it as a symbolic description of a God, God's dealing with humanity through, throughout time, you still can't get away from the fact that what this passage is teaching is that it's teaching that God is a God who pours out judgment. Now, as I said, this is a difficult reality to face. Facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult, which is why I found that many people actually either ignore it or they just minimize it. Now, what I mean is this. If you were to go down the street and you were to ask someone, you know, if you were to die tonight and you were to appear before God and God was to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Most people would say, most people would say, I, God, well, I think you should let me into heaven because I've been a good person. See, most people, most people, when they think of God, they think of God either like, they think of God as being like Santa Claus, this benevolent figure who just sort of, you don't, don't really take serious, but who just laughs at, what, at anything people do. So I think most people, they, they tend to minimize or, or just ignore the reality of God's judgment. Um, further, but it's not, just, it's not just the common people who actually ignore or minimize the reality of God's judgments. It's also scholars. You know, there are scholars who would say, yes, the Bible, like passages like this one, are teaching about God as a God of judgment. But there are scholars who say, you know, in the end, everyone will be saved. In the end, everyone will be saved, regardless of what they believe, regardless of, you know, what they've done. It's interesting, a few years ago, there was this Christian author who was the most popular Christian author that, that, you know, out there, and he wrote a book that made headlines all over the world. The book's name was Love Wins, because he claimed in the end that love would win and that everyone would be saved regardless of what they believed, regardless of what they did. Now, while I do, get this, I do disagree with these theologians, of course, I can't understand why they would have this sentiment because facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult. How do you square a picture of a God of, God, of, a God of love with the picture of God that, is, that was just read out in Revelation 15 and 16? Maybe that's a question that you have asked, but you never thought, you never dared, maybe that's a question you asked yourself, but you never dared to ask in church. Is it actually just for God to pour out such severe judgments on people? How can God still be called a God of love when he drains the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath? Well, I believe that the reason... Now, now go with me on this. I believe that the reason we so struggle with the reality of judgment is because we don't see sin the way that God sees it. Can I just suggest to you 
that because our nature is tainted with sin, and because we live in a world that is tainted with sin, and it's all we've ever known, we do not feel about sin the way that God feels about sin. You see, God is holy, and, and God has never sinned, and God has never had any sin in his presence. We just read in chapter 15 and verse 5 about this holy tabernacle in which God dwells. And so sin grieves him. For us, understanding God's holiness is a little bit like explaining to a fish what it's like to breathe air. All the fish knows is water. And while they may be able to understand it intellectually, that is, if a fish had a bigger brain, um, they do not really understand experientially because all a fish has ever known is water. And I think the same is true for us, is all we've ever known is sin. And so we can't really grasp, can't really grasp really the holiness of God and how offensive sin is to God. Can I just invite you to consider this from God's perspective? You see, God made a pristine world. God made a world in which everything was good. And he gave human beings everything that they would need for life and happiness. And he gave human beings only one command. He gave them only one thing that they were to do to express their love towards him. And what did they do? What did we do? We rebelled against him. And now we devise ways in order to sin. We steal, we boast, we murder, we lust. And even the best of us, our thoughts most of the time are centered on ourselves. Now, God is a God of love, but it is precisely because he is a God of love that sin offends him. Love means that he can't stand by and just be indifferent to sin. God is angry at racism. He is angry at materialism and how it hollows people out. He is angry at the unequal distribution of wealth in our world, which means this morning, while we're enjoying a beautiful auditorium with lights and heating, there are many children around the world who are starving. Whatever you feel towards the injustice that you see in the world, God feels it way more. And can you imagine how much injustice there is in the world to offend God? You know, we are supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Is that what we're supposed to do? Yeah? Just think back to this week. Just consider the last seven days. How much sin did you commit? When you were not walking by faith, you were sinning. Think about the things that you didn't do that you should have done. Think, think about the things that you shouldn't have done. Think about your thoughts, the thoughts that you had that were displeasing to God. Now multiply that by 6 billion people on the planet and multiply that by 10,000 years. Can you imagine how grieved God must feel over sin? As I said, this is precisely because he is a God of love, that he feels so much righteous anger towards sin. And because he is God, he sees all of the mess, all of the muck. And so when you think about it this way, I think he is completely justified in his judgments against sin and sinners. Even though it's difficult, and I get that, to face the reality of God's judgment, I think considering what we've just said, these judgments that we read about in the book of Revelation are completely justified. Considering the amount of contempt that we as human beings have had towards God every moment of our lives, there could be no wind too cold, no night too dark, no crash too startling, and yes, no judgment less severe than what we actually deserve. So facing the reality of judgment is difficult. But I want to actually show you this morning that even though facing the reality of judgment is difficult, it is really beneficial for our soul. It's actually really beneficial for our soul. And I want to show you three reasons why facing the reality of judgment is actually really beneficial for our soul. Here's the first one. Facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult, but it's ultimately beneficial because it magnifies God's grace. Look down in verse 2 of chapter 15. After John sees seven angels coming with seven plagues, he says in verse 2, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, 
and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. So these are the tribulation saints standing beside the sea of glass with the harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now, what is the song of Moses? Well, the song of Moses was the song that he sang in Exodus 15 when he defeated, when God defeated the the enemies of Israel and delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. And what is the song of the Lamb? Well, it's the same thing. It's the song of our deliverance as God conquers our enemies, sin, death, and the devil. And you see, even though facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult, it is amazing because it magnifies God's grace. You see, you will only see grace as amazing. Grace only becomes amazing to those who see how much sin has angered God and therefore they realize how costly it was for God to forgive them. You know, it's no surprise to me that it that in liberal churches who cannot face the reality of God's judgment, these are typically churches with no heat, with no true passion, because you only see how great and amazing are his deeds, and you only know how just and true are his ways by facing the reality of judgment, because through facing the reality of judgment, this magnifies his amazing grace. You know, some of our families here at City Reach come from other countries. And in those countries, they had to struggle to survive. In those countries, there were not just systems of government. There were not social welfare networks. There were not well-paying jobs. And they come to Australia, and we have a just government. We have a social welfare network that will help pick you up if you fall down. And, and, And we have jobs here in Australia. You can get a job in Australia. And because of where they come from, they probably see better than us how blessed we are to live in Australia. I mean, we often take our country for granted. We take it for granted. We take it for granted how if you are sick, you can go to a hospital and can get, see a doctor. That is a blessing. We take it for granted that we can switch on a light and there is electricity. We take it for granted that we can drink fresh, clean drinking water. But these people remember. You see, the poverty of their past helps magnify the blessings of their present. And in the same way, facing the reality of God's judgment, even though it's difficult, it is beneficial because it helps magnify God's grace. Knowing how much he hates sin And will judge sin actually magnifies what a great act it was for him to forgive us. But secondly, it's not only beneficial because it magnifies God's grace. It's also beneficial because it maintains God's just character. I don't know about for you, but for me, one of the biggest problems of living in our world is the problem of justice. There doesn't seem to be justice Um, In our world, it seems like the wicked prosper and people suffer. Last weekend, I was at the Bowdoin campus, our Bowdoin family, and I was preaching there. That's why I wasn't here last Sunday. And we had this young Aboriginal woman come in. Uh, Pastor Andrew had been to the train station and he'd invited this beautiful young lady called Julie in. You all got to pray for her. She came last Sunday and she just tucked in under the arm of Pastor Andrew when he was up hosting the service, and and she wanted to share with the community, and she just shared in front of everyone how her grandfather had been a pastor and how she was struggling with addictions. And I have to tell you, even though I I don't want to get political because I don't know all the issues involved, I've, I've got to be honest about that, we would all agree that the Aboriginal people have been treated poorly in Australia. And my heart goes out to them. Because where is the justice? Where is the justice? But this is not a new problem. Psalm 73, the psalmist said, Behold, these are the wicked. They are always at ease. They increase in riches. 
All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocent. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt maybe you maybe you go to school and you work really hard, you work really hard and you only get a B minus and someone else cheats and they get an A plus? Or maybe in your workplace, I mean you you work for years for your boss. You 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 show up and do the same thing over and over again and then this new person comes and they get promoted in front of you and you wonder where is the justice in this world? Where is the justice? Well, this is why facing the reality of God's judgment is beneficial because not only does it magnify God's grace, it also maintains God's just character. You see, I don't know about for you, but when I go out talking to people about Jesus, is this what you find? When I go out talking to people about Jesus, what's the number one thing, what number one question they have? What's the number one obstacle that they have to faith? Here's what I find when I talk to people about Jesus. They say something like this. How can God be a good God when there is so much evil and suffering in the world? If God is so good, this is the question, is it not? Why doesn't he intervene? Well, here in Revelation, we see him intervening. You see, if there was ever a group of people who suffered injustice, it will be the tribulation saints as they are opposed in the tribulation. And yet God stands up for them. Look down in verses five and six of chapter 16. After the third angel pours out his bowl and the rivers and springs become blood, the angel cries out, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, For you bought these judgments, for they have, the people of earth, shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. See, it's really ironic to me that the same group of people who would say that they would never believe in God because it seems like there is no justice in the world, when they read passages like this about God pouring out his justice, they cannot accept them. You see, if there is no judgment, there is no justice. All of the injustice in the world goes unpunished if there is no judgment. But what this reminds us is that just as God will hold the tribulational rebels accountable for their unjust actions against his people, he will hold all people accountable for their injustice and every wrongdoing will actually be called to account. Now, this inevitably leads me to my third reason this morning why facing the judgment of God is beneficial. It's only beneficial because it magnifies God's grace. And it's not only beneficial because it maintains God's character. But thirdly, it's beneficial because it motivates us to run to and to rest in Jesus. You see, as I said, God is no respecter of persons. What I mean by that is he doesn't discriminate on the basis of age, gender, ethnicity, or or whether you grew up in a Christian family or you grew up in going to a Christian church, every single person is accountable to him and God will hold all people accountable for their actions. It will be impossible to escape his judgment. The Bible clearly teaches that it is appointed to man to die once and after that comes the judgment. And facing the reality of this fact, motivates us to the only place of safety in the day of judgment. You see, in chapter 16, there will be no place of refuge for people to run to on the earth. Even the tribulational saints will have to endure. But there is a place of safety that you can run to from God's eternal judgment. There is a place of refuge that will protect you from God's eternal judgment. And where is that place? Well, it is the place where his judgment has already fallen. Let me ask you a question. Where is the safest place to stand in a bushfire? The safest place to stand in a bushfire, I'm told, is where the fire has already burnt. If you stand in a place where the fire has already burnt, you will be safe because the fire will have no fuel left to burn. And let me tell you the place where the fires of God's just anger against sin has already burnt. It has already burnt on Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the full fury of the wine of the wrath of God on our behalf. He endured it all. He took all the punishment. All the injustice was placed on him. 
You know, we talked before about how much God must be grieved by all the sin of the world. And I asked you to think about your life. And I asked you to multiply it by 6 billion and then by 6,000. Well, think of this, all of that grief, all of that sin, all of that injustice towards sin was felt by Jesus. Jesus suffered on the cross the full cup of the fury of God's wrath on our behalf. So he is the only place to run for refuge. But get this, it is only people who face that reality who actually run to him. It is only those who recognize I'm not a good person, that when I die, I can't present to God my life, the works of my life. The only answer that will matter when you stand before God, when he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? The only answer that will suffice in that day is because I ran to Jesus and he is my refuge. But not only, I know many of you are Christians, and not only does facing the reality of God's judgment most run to Jesus, it also helps you to rest in Jesus. So look down in verse 15 of chapter 16. As, as the river Euphrates dries up and demonic spirits are unleashed, deceiving the nations to assemble against God, Jesus speaks. Do you see that? It's written in red in your Bible. That means it's Jesus' words. And he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, who keeps his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be exposed. You see, as Christ followers, when we are struck Again, by the sober reality of God's judgment against sin, it is good for our souls because it blows apart self-righteousness and it helps us to rest alone in Christ. One of my favorite songs at the moment is a song by Sovereign Grace and it's called Cling to Christ. It goes like this. I want you to listen to these lyrics. This is a great song. It says, Father, I can come to you and boast of deeds I've done. In my pride, I strive to earn the favor Christ has won. He alone pleads my acceptance or my works aside. So I come with empty hands and I cling to Christ. You know, one of the things that will prevent you from growing as a Christian is not only getting entangled in sin, but is being filled with self-righteousness. Um, Tim Keller once said, Christians not only repent of their sin, they also repent of self-righteousness. This is, this is the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, he says, I want to know Christ. Who here wants to know Christ? Who here wants to know Christ? He says, I want to know him. And so you know what he says? He says, so what I do is I consider all things lost for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus more, my Lord. I count all things as loss. And I cling to him alone. Maybe part of the reason you are not fired up for God is not just because of sin, but it's because of self-righteousness. We can all, as Pastor Carl spoke this morning in communion, we can all start to bring things to the communion table and say, these are the things that commend me before you, God. But they're not. When you're hit by the reality of God's judgment, you realize on that day, the only garment that you will be wearing is not the garment of your own performance. How pathetic will that be? The only garment that you will wear will be the garment of Christ's righteousness. I want you to imagine if you were in a plane and you were going along and they told you, this plane is going to crash. You need to jump out of this plane. And you said, okay, I will just try to flap my rings really hard. That, it, that ain't working. You're going to go splat on the ground. But if there was a but if there was a parachute, if there was a parachute, how much would you cling to that parachute? You'd put that parachute on, you'd hold on to that parachute, you'd treasure that parachute, you'd be singing about that parachute. <laughs> My hope is built in this parachute. Can you see what I'm saying? The reality of God's coming judgment means that we should cling to Christ. Father, I can come to you. And I can boast of deeds I've done. I'm a pastor. I've led people to Christ. I can boast about that. In my pride, I can strive to earn the favor Christ has won. But he alone pleads my acceptance. All my works aside, 
So I come with empty hands and I cling to Christ. You see, the growth that you have as a Christian is not just a growth in changing your character, it's actually a growth in humility. If you're not growing deeper in humility, as you come closer to the Son of Righteousness, you see the wickedness of your soul. And if you're not actually becoming more humble and saying, I need you, Jesus, I need you, Jesus, I need you today more than I need you the first day when I trusted in you, then something is wrong. See, facing the reality of judgment is good for our soul because it helps us to run to and rest in Jesus. So facing the reality of God's judgment is difficult, but it's ultimately beneficial because it magnifies God's grace. It maintains God's just character and it motivates us to rest and run to Jesus. So I want to encourage you today to do this. Face the reality of God's judgment today, for you will one day. Let me say that again. Face the reality of God's judgment today, for you will one day. The sad reality of chapter 16 is that God is pouring out judgment on these people. And when God pours out judgment, yes, it is to demonstrate his justice, but it's also to get people's attention. It's also so that people will ta come and run back to him for his grace. But as he pours out judgment, what do the people do? The people harden their heart. After, after the fourth judgment, it says they did not repent of their deeds. After the fifth judgment, it says they did not repent of their deeds. And at the final judgment of chapter 16, it says that they cursed God. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Face the reality of God's judgment today, for you will one day. I'd like to invite the band to come back on stage now. You know, facing reality is difficult, but it is ultimately beneficial. That day, after months of refusing to face the reality that something was wrong in my car engine, what happened was I got in my car and I went to drive to a wedding. And on the way to the wedding, the sound was really, really bad in the vehicle. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought I was just ignoring reality. Oh, it'll go away. It didn't go away. It got worse. And then eventually up on Northeast Road, my car said, I ain't going no further. And it stopped. I took my car to a mechanic and asked them if they could fix it. And they said, you need a new car. Your car's stuffed. It only had about 70,000 Ks on the clock. I learned a very, very, very important lesson that day. Facing reality is difficult, but is ultimately beneficial. Face the reality of God's judgment today, for you will one day. The reality for all of us is that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's holy standard. But God, in His enormous love, has made a place of refuge at great cost to Himself in sending His Son, Jesus, to suffer the full fury of God's wrath for sin so that we can come, we can be forgiven, we can be put right with God, we can enter into His family and have the hope of eternal life. That's available for you today. So I want to, I want to just invite you just to come, just to come. We've all had, you know, and if maybe today, maybe you don't know it all yet, that's okay. But why don't you just pray this simple prayer to the Lord and say, Lord, make yourself known to me. Help me to understand. Lord, I, don't, I want to face reality. I recognize I'm not a good person. I need you, God. Help me understand it all and open my heart to you.